So, thank you very much, and a warm welcome from my side. My name is Thomas. I'm a product manager at Micro Epsilon. We, I have a look today at two measuring principles. One of them is the deflectometry, and one of them is wavefront sensors. And we want to tell you about how it is possible to uh, detect components and optical parts with these sensor, uh, sensor systems. So nowadays, unfortunately, um, a lot of um, um, yeah, a lot of transparent and highly reflected surfaces are still um, um, inspected by the human eye. So this is a very uh, employee-intensive, a very work-intensive, and a very feature-intensive job to do. So um, what we want to do now is have the opportunity to do an automated visual inspection on uh, transparent and highly reflective surfaces. So uh, the thing here is, by doing uh, such an inspection with a sensor, you automatically get a protocol which uh, can you use or the customer use. And uh, so the manufacturer and you have the same common database. So this is a little bit about my motivation today. So uh, first of all, you already passed through the motivation, so it will be a little bit shorter now. And what I want to show you next is, what is Micro Epsilon, if you don't know the company yet? Um, then I want to tell uh, talk about the Shaq Hartmann sensor, about our reflect control sensor. And then we did some measurements um, on optical mirrors. And then there's a comparison between the two sensor principles. And uh, in the last point, I want to do a uh, short summary here. So who is Micro Epsilon? If you don't know us yet, we are a German technology company, mostly focused on uh, sensors and systems um, for solutions for, uh, for the customer. And our principle here is more precision. So for you, if you uh, don't know what we are doing or what sensors we have in the portfolio, we have uh, laser triangulation sensors, we have uh, convocal chromatic sensors, um, white light interferometry, capacitive sensors, eddy current sensors, inductive, uh, magneto-inductive sensors, and also draw wire sensors. But there is still more. So um, we have also 2D, 3D line scanner, um, 3D snapshot sensoric, uh, measurement systems, and uh, optical micrometer, um, fiber optic uh, sensors, color sensors, uh, thermal imager, pyrometer, and also laser distance sensor. So there's a, quite a, a broad portfolio, as I would say. But let's talk about the two sensor principles I want to show you today. So first of all, uh, I want to give you a small insight into our wavefront sensors here. So um, the easiest way to describe a wavefront sensor is uh, by a light source which has a wavefront which comes out of it. And next, uh, you could uh, say the, the wavefront, if it is far away from the light source, becomes a plano wavefront in this case. Then you have an optical system where the wavefront passes through. And after this, uh, passing through the uh, defined optical system, you have an aberrated wavefront. And this aberrated wavefront now can be detected by a Shaq Hartmann wavefront sensor. So let's have a look inside such a sensor. So um, in our case, uh, on the bottom side, you can see there is the Shaq Hartmann uh, camera with the wavefront sensor integrated. On top of it, you have uh, the fiber light source where you can use a, a laser diode or an LED, whatever you want and um, then you pass uh, the light through the system by uh, um, telescopic objective, by various objectives inside, and what you get is a high quality output beam. On the right hand side, you can also see an, an image of what this will look like in reality. So, um, we had a look at the inside. So, um, the inside always stays the same. What you now can do with it is uh, by doing a double pass configuration, you could do different setups. And with the different setups, you have different opportunities um, 
to measure um, reflect um, to re measure on spheric on flat surfaces uh, lenses telescopes uh, binoculars and so there are uh, different uh, ways of detecting um, measurement objects here so in the test configuration um, the reflective light uh, can be tested. You have a, a double pass testing here. And yet there are a lot of different samples which can be tested by such a sensor. So um, you could um, use it for, for mirrors, you could use it for um, objectives, uh, binoculars. And also we have a system which has a high performance here. So we can measure with up to 10 hertz. We have um, uh, an output beam which is approximately uh, a tenth, uh, 20th of lambda. It is um, uh, easy uh, set up and can be easily integrated and set up here. The other system I want to show you and uh, shortly talk about is our reflect control sensor. It is based on face measuring deflectometry. So what we have here is a system which works with a screen which is protecting a sign pattern on your reflective target. And with two cameras, we then um, can uh, create 2D images based on the camera images and also uh, create a 3D point cloud by laying both of these uh, areas on top of each other. What this looks like is presented here. So uh, we start with our uh, sign pattern on the surface, which uh, generates uh, the, uh, the different images for us and uh, what you get is on the first place an amplitude image where you can um, have a look at the reflectivity of the surface, a curvature image which, which describes the surface as it is and uh, on top of it you also get a 3D point cloud of your reflective surface. A measurement time here is approximately two seconds and uh, the processing time afterwards will take another about three seconds here. So the 2D images you get, this is an example um, um, in the, of the battery industry here. So uh, the system works because all of these batteries have a slight foil on it. And the foil is reflective and so we can measure with the reflect control here. The first place you get uh, is we call it base intensity image. So the base intensity image is more or less what you get from a normal um, high class vision system. So in the first place, you might think there is no failure on top of it. In the second step, we also get an amplitude image. In the amplitude image, as I described, uh, you get an impression of the different reflectivities of the surface. So for example, the fingerprints, which are on top now, can be seen quite good. And then in the last step, you also get the curvature image. And uh, the curvature image is for uh, detecting any difference in the surface normal here. So as you see, you wouldn't see the scratch which is, in the, um, which is on, on the battery on top uh, without having uh, also the curvature image here. And what we also can do now is um, everything which can be seen in our curvature image can also be transferred into a 3D point cloud. And by transferring it into a 3D point cloud, you can also do a measurement with it and perhaps measure the depth of such a scratch. So, so much to the second measurement principle I wanted to show you here. And now we had to look for uh, different measurement objects which um, can be measured with both systems. So in the first place, the wavefront sensor, so uh, we had to look for um, some, some smaller uh, targets here. And uh, within the second step with the reflect control sensor, where we um, have to have a very shiny uh, or reflective surface. So we came up with three different mirrors. The first mirror we measured was a, a mirror with a gold finish and um, a, a peak to valley with a lambda fourth. The second one, was a planner made of zero duo, with aluminium finish, and um, had a, a surface which was lambda 10. And the third one was a little bit bigger mirror with uh, 25 millimeter in diameter and a peak to valley um, of lambda 1. So what we did here now is uh, setting up a test series and we did 
uh, four or five measurements while uh, the mirror stands still to have a look at the repeatability of the systems. And also we uh, had four measurements where we tur uh, turned these mirrors always by 90 degrees so we can also say uh, how reproducible the systems were. All PV values which I will show you now are uh, rounded to full nanometer and when it comes to the RMS value it's rounded to a tenth uh, nanometer. So um, the first uh, thing uh, we had here was the measurement with the reflect control system. So as you can see the reflect control system is al also uh, able to measure a peak to valley um, value in the nanometer range. So we can go down to 10 nanometer approximately and we are very stable in the measurement itself and uh, the RMS values also are really quite stable here. Same thing, more or less, uh, when it comes to the Shek Hartmann wavefront sensor. So there is also high stability when it comes to the peak to valley values and also when it comes to the RMS values. There is a slight difference between the values you, you, you see of the reflect control system and the Shek Hartmann sensoric, but I will come to this point a little bit later on. Then uh, the tests um, were where we turned. I have to hurry up, I get a signal here. Okay, then uh, we turned all the mirrors a little bit by, by 90 degree steps and also here we are quite stable. And uh, the, the next thing is we did it with the Shek Hartmann sensoric where we also turned uh, the mirrors by 90 degrees and get quite the same values here. So uh, all in all we did uh, the tests for all the three mirrors and what you can see here is that there are only slight difference between the measurement principles. So it is basically possible to measure on these mirror type surfaces uh, with both measurement principles. And always as it comes to vision systems you get slight differences um, in a nanometer range. But I think we can show that both systems are able to, to measure on such surfaces. So pros and cons, perhaps we can talk about the pros and cons later on. Um, um, or a little deciding matrix where to uh, decide what sensor type you should use. Perhaps uh, one point here, the target size. If the targets get too big, use the reflect control. If they are a little bit smaller, just use the Shek Hartmann sensor. Is the first um, thing you, which you can have a look at. So what I wanted to tell you today uh, is whenever you have a look at a transparent object like glass foils or other plastics, uh, high reflective surfaces like polished metal, a mirror, shiny ceramics and stuff. So please don't be like these guys. Um, please think about a quality control other than the human eye because you wouldn't also want to do this job. So thank you very much for your attention. I think I'm a little bit out of time, but if you have any questions, please feel free to ask. We are in Hall 10 uh, and at booth uh, 10. Uh, C30 and you can, can visit me there and, and ask all of your questions. Thank you. Hi, good morning. Uh, my name is Jung Tran Nguyen. I'm from Notke. Okay, sorry. <laughs> Got a little bit higher. Um, my name is Jung Tran Nguyen from Notke, a manufacturer in China and I want to talk with you today about ultra compact controller platform for smart sorting system but also other manufacturing systems here you can see a sneak about that yeah um, let's start before we start I want to talk about smart logistics you know smart logistics not always are combined with technical stuff that's why I love this video I found that on LinkedIn just to show you Sometimes smart logistic means just to be on point. This is on point for this application. But as we know nowadays, everything is much more chaotic. Many things, many applications that are running, all products has to be uh, produced in one step. Sorters has to run with videos and all that stuff. So talking about matching on point matching on point with hardware and software real-time application 
workload consolidation. Yeah, as we know, manufacturing systems, sorter systems, as uh, case sorters, unisorters, case unisorters, un autonomous mobile robots, AMRs. We know them all. They're getting more and more advanced, more difficult, more applications like um, incorporate capabilities like uh, traffic user interfaces, getting more difficult, more 3D examples, high performance cameras. We see them here every year, better cameras and all working with real time and on one workload. This consolidate hub there. That means we are aiming on ultra complex controller platform to provide and support all these functions even on one computer without sacrificing and determinizing performance. We provide our CPU platform uh, small with eight to nine centimeters with a carrier board uh, and can be flexible. As we see all these camera systems here, all my pre-talker said it, um, very difficult, more advanced applications coming and will need better hardware in cooperation with software, real-time software. To handle this, we have provided this ultra-compact uh, platform to provide, as you say and see here, for different applications for all for one, one computer, like PoE to control the camera systems, as we see here, but also Canvas system, Ethercat system, all on one PC. This will match together with the real-time application and support your applications, your camera system, your advanced sorter systems with that. Uh, we have been here at the booth at 8D15 in this hall. Uh, we have set up some examples for you. Uh, maybe you can can over and we can talk a little bit deeper about our ultra compact hardware controller systems. So we have a branch in the Netherlands and uh, in Germany as well an office. So looking forward to have a deeper talk with you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, uh, my name is Javier Perez and I'm going to talk about the zero gravity 3D technology. I come from the Instituto Tecnológico of Informatica. And well, the first question you must be asking yourself is what is the zero gravity 3D technology? Well, it is a solution we designed for uh, industrial inspection and the maybe, sorry, the main idea is to inspect the pieces from multiple cameras so the objects are coming in a conveyor like this and then we place them in the center of a sphere with many cameras around it and when the object is mainly is mostly in the center of the sphere we take a picture with each of these cameras and then we start to inspect it this has some advantages as you can see uh, this is a 360 degrees inspection. We are capable of inspecting up to 800 pieces per hour, so more than one piece per second. And then we do three different kinds of analysis. We do geometric and surface analysis. We do GD and T metrology and also classification. Well, uh, what the, our device do, it goes from these 16 cameras to uh, 3D reconstruction that we are able to inspect and detect some defects or whatever it is in the piece we are inspecting. First of all, we do a 3D reconstruction, as I said before. This is an example of an orange we are inspecting for, um, for a project with fruits. 
then we do a classification because depending on the type of fruit exactly, the type of orange, we will set different thresholds or different uh, measures to do it. Then we align it with a reference because maybe in the case of oranges it's not so important, but in the case of industrial inspection it is really important to align it. So we align the three degree construction with a, with our reference model, and then we start doing the the analysis. The first of all is a geometric analysis. We compare the three degree construction we just made of the object we have inspected with the with the model. So we can see here the parts that are missing in, in our 3D reconstruction in, in blue and the parts that are uh, extra or shouldn't be in the, in the piece we are inspecting in red. Then we do a surface analysis because we can also analyze the, the surface in, in search for scratches or, or whatever we can find on it. So we have an example of, of wood. We are looking for some knots or maybe porosity in the, in the wood that shouldn't be there. Or just cracks or anything that uh, shouldn't be there. And at the end, it's also possible to do a gt &T analysis in which an, inge an engineer defines what we should measure in this, uh, in this piece. For instance, we have some, some lengths, some angles, or whatever, and we measure this different uh, parts and decide if it's inside the engineer threshold or not and if the parts should be rejected or it can go on on the, on the conveyor. In order to develop all this technology, we had to do different uh, research lines to, to investigate in different topics. So we have here uh, four that we are currently researching. And well, the first of all is multi-view 3D classification because uh, some parts in the industry are really similar to other parts. So it's, we have parts that are a reflection of the other and it is quite difficult to, to classify them from just one image. So we are mixing all this information from different cameras. And we are also able to discard unknown objects because this is quite important because uh, in our production pipeline, we don't want to introduce objects that we don't know what, the, what they are. And we require a precise classification, and it is simulation-based training. So we just need a reference. We don't need uh, hundreds of uh, images from a data set to train. We just need a, a reference model, and we train it, and we are capable of, of classifying this, this object. The next research line is pose estimation. As I said before, we have to align the reference to the 3D reconstruction we, we have just made. So we need a, a pose estimation. And we do this from multiple images also. And it is based on, on simulation. So we just, with the reference model, are capable of training some, uh, some characteristics in order to align them. And we use information from multiple cameras and align the, the object. We also use geometric as well as texture characteristics, so we can uh, align objects without texture or with texture. Then we have the multi-view stereo 3D reconstruction. This is something we are working on because most objects from industry doesn't have a texture that works well with uh, current uh, stereo reconstruction, so we are working with multi-view stereo 3D reconstruction that works with many cameras and we can achieve a better precision mainly in the inner 3D structure of the of the object. And finally we are also working in surface anomaly detection uh, which uh, the main difference with current research lines is we are just training from non-anomalous uh, samples because in 3D manufacturing we rarely have all the defects available to train so we have to train just with the correct pieces and then we also provide a 3D localized surface anomaly detection then well I will present some success stories that we are 
uh, uh, that we have currently installed in the, in the industry. We have the Recycle Compound Pro device that it is installed in the automotive sector. It provides automatic detection of contaminants. Pieces go in the conveyor and fall in the device. So we are having a multiple view from different cameras. And we detect if these pieces have any contaminants and can't be recycled. So uh, nowadays it is processing around one 0.7 tons of recycled material and it is a 100% inspection, 360 inspection of the pieces. And it takes almost three seconds per piece to be inspected and discarded or, or processed. We also work in different uh, topics. We also are working in bottle stoppers made from wood or cork, trying to find the surface anomalies or geometric anomalies. We also work for the automotive sector, measuring springs, as you have seen some in the previous slides. And we are also starting to work in plastic injected industry, trying to find defects in, in the production. As you can see here, some, uh, some coffee samples that are defective or, or not. This technology is protected by five patents that we have already, pre already uh, contributed. And there are two additional patents in, in progress. We have more than 18 contributions in this uh, technology, in high impact factor journals and, and conferences. And finally, we, this is our institute. Uh, so here is my contact in case you want to talk more about this technology. We are more than 320 employees and we have 30 years of experience. We are in Valencia in, in Spain. And well, we have some flyers of this technology in case you, you want. And well, this is all from my side. If there are any questions. Or... Thank you for the opportunity. So today I want to give you an introduction into our European project, uh, Platform Zero. And as Iman already told, it's about zero defect manufacturing you in the photovoltaic industry. So I want to introduce the consortium. It's actually four uh, research institutions and one university uh, focused on spectroscopic methodologies, which is um, IREC and HZB, and imaging, which, which are we. And then we have an optoelectronic assessment from, done from UPO from uh, Spain. And then AI analysis, which is done by us, IREC and RISC. And RISC is also uh, responsible for the whole data management. Then we also have uh, two research centers, um, which are actually um, focused in PV industries. So technology development, which is mainly ZSV and Loredera. And we have then metrology companies, which are, um, yeah, working in, um, as, a, like, as a company, producing uh, systems for actually spectroscopic imaging and also two producers of thin film PV uh, so, uh, foils. So what is the project about? Um, so actually, zero, uh, Platform Zero aims to uh, reach zero defect manufacturing in this specific area of thin film photovoltaics. Uh, it's a co-founded European project and running over four years, and we are now in, at eight min 18 months, or actually 20 months now. And uh, the aim is to actually really achieve zero defect manufacturing in this specific sector using means of artificial intelligence and sensor fusion. Um, and with this, uh, we want to tackle actually this, this specific area, but this is a more broader scale. And um, in four different uh, pilot lines, this will be implemented. So what is the, the context? As you may know, that uh, photovoltaics are in the, in the increase. Obviously, it's already comp contributing to 7.6% of the European energy mix. And it's expected to rise until uh, 2040 to more than 20%. So there's a big market, obviously. And uh, the latest generation of this PV production, so you, you all know the, the, the silicon sensor stuff, uh, but uh, they're always uh, not really flexible, obviously, because they're silicon. 
and this uh, thin film photovoltaics, they are quite flexible, they have still high performance and can be implemented in uh, like buildings, vehicles or IOTs. Yeah, however, their production is a bit, I try to move a bit here, let's see. Maybe this is better. Um, however, they're uh, it's still, still over channels, so it doesn't matter. Uh, however, the production uh, process is quite complex, which means that like small fluctuations in process parameters will lead to a really severe uh, effect defect in the in the end, and then producing a lot of waste. And that's exactly where what we want to tackle. So, if you have a look here, this is an example of, of such a production line. You have like various different process steps, and in these process steps, um, like different layers are deposited, and in each of those process steps, some errors can occur. Yeah. And the aim of the project is that for each of these process steps, we will have an advanced sensor station looking at the process afterwards, yeah, and then fuse all these data together in a, in a database and correlate it with production parameters. Yeah. And this is exactly where we are coming to play. So then in, in the database, there will be uh, some AI uh, running, which basically make then a prediction based on the, the sensor data how the outcome will be. And this should be all, so basically the whole project is about setting up this whole pipeline, this platform, and then fusing everything together, and then in the end, learning something about it. So here, uh, just an example. This is a, a six PV layer. Um, so you have like a, a, a pet and the barrier layer. Then this barrier layer gets uh, deposited with TCO, and then it gets structured. And this is like each of these is one pr production step. And in each of these steps, something can occur, which will then in the end have an impact on the final performance. Yeah. Then you have organic deposition structuring again, metal deposition structuring again. You can see that this is a, a quite continuous effort to, to produce these uh, this sheets. Yeah? And what we, we are doing also is we inspect. Now we have a visual inspection system in each of these advanced sensor stations. This is also our sensoric contributions. You can see here some of the sensors that we are presenting as our portfolio. And here we develop one specific for this. So this is how these advanced sensor stations will look like, or some so schematic of that. So this is already an example running, so a test example running at IREC, where uh, they fuse already uh, Raman, PL imaging, motorized, they have a motorized stage, and the spectral re reflectance imaging. And this, uh, this is like the first prototype for these advanced sensor stations. Here also our imaging si system will then be introduced. So you can, you can see that here, so on the left side, we have uh, this photometric setup. And I try to run this video now. So this is a multispectral illumination. Um, and we then uh, use this, the spectral response and then some error detection on the background of the images for then the, the final outcome in the, in the database. So, and this would be then such an outcome. So here, for example, we have different KPIs that we distribute. And one would be like the percentage of errors in the, on the surface, then the, the percentage of round effects of scratches, uh, and then the mean spectral response, because this is actually dependent on the, on the structural layer. So the spectral response, because these are super thin layers, and depending how thick they are, the spectral response is, is different. And then also some error percentage in the classes. And all these will basically then be fused and run in, in, in the cloud and contribute to the data fusion. Now to the PV production partners. We have four production lines. So one is uh, ZSV, you're using as a producing ticks. One is Luridera, they are using, uh, producing nanoparticles. Then we have solid technologies from Poland. They produce uh, castorite samples. Oh, no, periscite, sorry. And then Samplak, which also produce ticks, thin films. And uh, Pablo is so nice and is distributing some of these uh, gadget samples um, where you can have a look how such thin film foils look like and what you actually can do. So one of the most important or successful flashlights that exist, I think. So now to the whole structure process. So as you can see here, down, um, let's see if I can point something. So here down is this advanced sensor station. This is like located at each of these production steps. Then uh, the raw data is actually sent to a database and the production pro parameters are sent to a database. And within the database, then the Docker containers are running, uh, generating these KPIs and, and fusing them into an, 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 uh, a conditioning uh, CV, as a basically Excel file or a, CV, a CSV file, which is then used in the end for, uh, for machine learning. 
And here's uh, like all the different sensors and how the spectra look like. You can see that they are like super diverse. That's why each sensor produces themselves extract some KPIs out of that. And this is then all fused together into one uh, results uh, pipeline. And the whole architecture uh, is, is designed in, in order to be quite modular so that you can add or remove sensors depending on your production facility. And then uh, it should be quite agile and fast also to relearn the whole uh, chain. Now to our first test samples. So uh, this is the first test, uh, actually test samples that we acquired with this system. So we have these 11 different castorite samples imaged by XRF, Raman, reflectance, and photoluminescence. And this is then all fused in the database. And now we wanted to have a look, OK, does this actually make sense? So do we, can we actually classify anything out of this sensor fusion concept? And surprisingly, yes, it works really well. So we had 2,000 uh, different single solar cells. And they are labeled in three different classes, depending on the voltage response and then their IOC, so on their current. And we used actually just LDA, so local discriminant analysis, using all these sensors together. Yeah? And if you look at them individually, they perform moderate until well, I would say, like in the F1 score, if you have a look, and the accuracy. Uh, so we always used 80% for, for training the, the network, uh, so actually the, the machine learning, and 20% then for testing. And uh, you can see that we reach up, up to 80 90%. In some of the cases, some are really poor but none of them really achieves 100%. And only if you combine them all together, we reach actually 100% of F1 score. Uh, be aware that this is just the first test sample. So then in the end, of course, um, if you, we have that implemented in the pilot lines, it will probably change. But it, it shows that the overall concept of the sensor fusion and then like fusing everything together and have a kind of AI telling you what is the class or the classification is working. So for within the project, what are the next steps? So uh, uh, the patch two samples are sent out and distributed to all of the sensor producers. And these will be fed in into the, the database, which is now set up and running. We have the first um, advanced sensor stations running. So, we, uh, so that the imaging system that you, you saw is like the first hour prototype. And this will be shipped then to IREC, so the consortium leader. And they will fuse it all together into one machine. Um, then this KPI extraction is already running on the cloud. We still need to incorporate that for all the different sensor producers. So our part is already running. But then, of course, you, you need to adapt it a bit. Uh, the AI classification will be then used also on the patch 2 samples. And, um, and we are in preparation of including also production parameters. This is still not, not yet uh, done. But we are only in, in month 20 of this 48-month uh, project. OK. Yeah, here I uh, just wanted to give you an, a visual impression of the consortium. Um, so you can see there's a lot of different partners. So this was the 18th month review meeting, which was quite successful, as the results that I demonstrated also shows. And yeah, with that, I actually want to conclude and are looking forward to questions. And maybe, and hopefully, you had a look on these samples. <laughs>
so what I would like to do is I will approach the central idea how we can have a simple and unified uh, concept. I will quickly tell you what we need to measure and how we can do measure that and uh, give you an idea of the rich EMVA 1288 tool set which is, exam which is available. And then of course I give you some examples that you see how this is all working. And at the end I will of course also s tell you where uh, you can learn more. Okay, so the, the interesting thing is that you do basically, you treat the camera as a system. And uh, with this approach you can cover almost all types of cameras. And f to guide us how we have to set up the things, the first question we have to answer is what limits actually the quality of, a, of an image sensor? And there are basically four things. The first thing is each measurement you do, uh, you get a slightly different value. That is what we call temple noise. That's this nasty thing that you never get the same. But with an image sensor it's even more complex because you have not a single sensor, you have millions of them. And unfortunately they are not all equal. So each of these pixels gives you a slightly different response and that is what we call spatial non-uniformity. Third one is, even if you apply no light you, to your camera, you get a signal. And this signal is increasing with the exposure time you apply. So if the exposure time is increasing, you get a brighter and brighter image and finally you can saturate your camera without any light reaching it. And so this limits basically the maximum possible exposure time you can use and you need to analyze what is called the dark signal. How this is changing with the exposure time. Well, and finally, no sensor can uh, uh, detect unlimited light. It has what's, what, uh, a maximum signal that can be detected, and that is what we call saturation capacity. So these are the basic four limitations of image sensors. And how can we now get them? And the system theoretic approach the power of it is that we do not know anything about what is in the camera. It's simply a completely black box. So we do simply an input-output relation. The input is the photons which hit the pixels during the exposure time. This gives us a mean number of photons. Uh, and this signal is already noisy because that is what is coming from quantum mechanics that the variance is basically even to the mean number of photons uh, you, are, you, you have. Uh, you can, no camera manufacturer can avoid this noise. Then additional noise sources may be in the camera and they influence then both the mean signal you get and also the variance of your signal. So this is always in mu uh, is a mean value and in sigma, the crack sigma, you have the variance. And without any model and anything knowing in what you still can do is you can do two important things. The first thing is you can measure the so-called sensitivity or characteristic curve. That means what is the signal I get as a function of the number of photons. Basically from complete dark to saturation. The second thing what you can measure is since you measure both your mean signal and the variance, you know the quality of your output signal actually. You know how good is actually my signal. And that is what we call the output signal to noise ratio. It's a mean value divided uh, by uh, the standard deviation then. And so the key parameter is really the signal to noise ratio. The definition is uh, uh, up here. It's of course the signal minus the dark signal because you are only interested in light induced signal divided by the, um, by the uh, standard deviation. And the, the SNR is really the key parameter. The only trouble is, normally you think simply about SNR. But if you do not know the shape of the characteristic curve, if it's not linear, your input SNR might be different from the output SNR you are measuring. That is something you normally don't think about because we are so much used to linear systems. So what we actually really want to know is not the signal to noise ratio at the output,
but the signal to noise ratio at the input that means the mean number of photons divided by the standard deviation how good we can measure it you are not interested really in dns you are interested in how bright is actually what i am measuring and how good can i measure this brightness that is what you want to do if you have of course a linear response and things are easy that is what we are used to then noise and signal is amplified by the same factor and this input and the output signal are the same. If you have a nonlinear response, you can compute, fortunately, the input SNR from the output SNR by the slope of the characteristic curve. Uh, I cannot go into details. I just tell you we can do it. Uh, and uh, at the end, I will tell you where you can learn how to do it in detail. The next interesting thing is you can always say what is the best possible camera. And the best possible camera is a camera which where only the input noise is counted and nothing, no other noise sources come in. That means it is the standard deviation of uh, the, the photon shot noise. And this is just a square root out of the mean thing. So the in, ideal SNR you can get is unfortunately not infinity because you have a noisy input signal. It's just a square root out of the mean number of photons. That means you can always compare your camera with the, uh, with, with the ideal one. Then we have non-uniformity. You have them in the dark that you get not only pixel to pixel variation, but unfortunately stripes like this. And the same is true, of course, Oops. same is true, of course, for the sensitivity that this might be a changing and even large scale variations. And so the the temporal variance actually is quite easy to, to, to learn because we only need the variance. But for this, uh, the spatial variance, it's more difficult. But still, we can measure these two things with only two images. That is a, another important key. One image contains, of course, temporal noise and spatial non-uniformity. You cannot distinguish it. But if you take two images and sub, by the same conditions, subtract them, then you get rid of the spatial non-uniformity because this is stationary. Everything what is not stationary is part of the noise. And so by taking the difference of two images, we have only in the difference image only the temporal noise. And then we can even go further. We can take co compute a, a, a column and then we get only the row variation because the column variation, of course, is, is and the pixel to pixel variation is then and basically eliminated and we can also have a mean a spatial uh, uh, from the mean column we can calculate the spatial uh, row variance so we cannot we can always distinguish non-uniformities pixel variations column variations and row variations which are very important for the non-uniformity uh, so we can put all these two things together we can also form a signal to non-uniformity ratio which is basically the mean value divided by the standard deviation of the non-uniformity now. And if we put everything together to the total SNR, it's a, it's a mean signal divided by the squared, um, by the sum of the variances, and then we have, of course, to take the square root out of it. So, and with the total, if we compare SNR and total SNR, we can immediately say, is a camera limited either by, uh, by non-uniformities or by temporal noise. And measuring procedures is, I uh, just tell you, of course, what we have to do is we have to take a sequence of irradiation steps from dark to saturation, non-uniformity. Unfortunately, we have to do many images because we have to suppress the temporal noise. There's other, no other way than averaging. So, uh, th but that we do only at selected uh, in the dark and at selected saturation, so only a few. And then we have to make, of course, a dark current measurement with a series of different exposure times. In addition, you can have optional measurements like temperature dependency of the dark current or, of course, the dependency of the quantum efficiency um, as a function um, uh, for the complete sensitivity range of the camera. And the nice thing is with the 1288 standard, you can always add, if a customer or yourself are interested in special properties, you can simply add them uh, so that you get the information you can, uh, can do. Of course, you have to do all the measurements at the same setting of the camera, because otherwise you can cheat. 
that is one of the important uh, conditions um, that you have to do uh, in these things. The irradiation is very flexible. We want to know about what is happening at the sensor. So we normally illuminate, as it's shown on the left, um, uh, directly the sensor. But we can also do it with a lens. And we can also do it just with an with a aperture. Uh, so that you can, this is basically for the chief ray angle. You have sensors which have shifted micro lenses. And so with parallel illumination, it would not work. So all these things are possible. And then we have a rich tool set, especially, of course, for the non-uniformities, because non-uniformity is not only characterized by the standard deviation. Uh, what, uh, we have a statistical analysis, which is an overall evaluation, but then the really nasty things are patterns. Because we, with our eyes, see it, and uh, your, call, your algorithms also see it. Uh, and yeah, okay, a little bit uh, closer, okay. So we do then Fourier transform so that you can, uh, can see the uh, really periodic patterns. Uh, and we do also that we can see the bad guys, so pixels which are outliers uh, with a logarithmically scaled histogram. And we can capture basically all types of non-uniformities with a set of profiles um, which, uh, uh, which basically give you a row, a mean row, and then out positive outliers and negative outliers. But now let's finally come to the examples. The first thing is are these profiles. The green line is a middle row. The black row is basically the black thing which you hardly see here, which is much smoother, is a mean row. So immediately you can see you have no uh, column variation because otherwise it would still, uh, even in the average show. Then we have the maximum values in each column, then you see this is, of course, at the edge of the distribution, so it shifted up. But you can nicely see you have four outliers, four so-called hot pixels. And then you can see for the negative outliers, it's suddenly almost zero. We have one line which is defect. So we saw then that this, the first line of the sensor was not OK. Uh, all these things you can immediately see with these profiles. A typical high-end. Uh, linear industrial camera in the visible range. The most important thing is, of course, the SNR blot. This is the exposure in photons per pixel. And here we have the SNR, also in logarithmic scale. And then the thick black line here is the best possible performance you can have for a sensor without any improvement. Uh, and then you see the real data as a little bit lower. That is because of the limiting of a quantum efficiency, which is not one. So you have counting less. But then it's going parallel all the time, and only very much in the dark, the very dark, you see the influence of the dark noise. So not much dark noise is in there in this camera. And you see, you can the minimum you can see is where the SNR is one, is about four photons. So the absolute sensitivity threshold is four photons. It's about, as you can see, the saturation range is more than 10,000, where the limit is. If you look now for a sphere camera, it's completely different. First, you have a much higher saturation, because you have typically larger pixels. It's now not 10,000, but it's 100,000, more than 10 times. And therefore, although the, the highest SNR is not 100, but it's rather 400 here in this example, so four times better. But the curve here of the measurements is much steeper. That means over the whole range, this sensor is already limited by the dark noise. Completely different behavior. And that leads to a much worse um, absolute sensitivity threshold, which is now more than 200 photons. So you need more than 200 photons just to, to start seeing a signal. So you can nicely see how good it is. Then we have a final example, the HDR color camera, which is here now measured. You see all of them is a linear behavior. It's 24-bit signal. So a one million from one photon to basically more than a million of photons. And the SNR looks, of course, now different because there is switching between a large photodiode 
in the dark range to a small photo diet in the lower range and two different gains. So you see actually four, four parts in this curve. And finally, I show polarization. A sensor here, I just show you one thing, namely that we can have these nice histograms of the polarization angle. That's one of the tools uh, uh, in, the, in the standard. Uh, and you see nicely how well aligned this is with this sensor, that they, they, they are just changing less than one degree in the angle of the polarization. Uh, very good behavior, and you see just one outlier here. Uh, that's really working very well. Well, uh, and finally, we may have a detailed analysis of the dark current uh, because unfortunately there are these hot pixels. And here you can see uh, it's, it's there are a lot of pixels where the dark current is 10 or even 20 or 30 times higher. You have additional peaks here. And that is also something we have added in the new standard. So a complete characterization of the camera, all you need for your practical applications. Um, and let me switch the conclusions. Uh, just uh, further material, you, you can download all these slides. Let me just sh uh, show you. Here I have, if you want to really to do measurements, there are online courses. You can just grab one of these uh, sheets here for the online courses. And I have also that book just appeared a, a week ago. The new 8th edition digital image uh, processing, unfortunately, unfortunately it's in German. Uh, but there is a detailed description also of the EMVA 1288 standard included in this book. So thank you very much for your attention and grab one of these things if you are interested or have a look here in the book. Thank you very much for your attention.